My message tonight is Antichrist and history's greatest religious cover-up. Question, do you eat to the beat? Is it Mark? I've never thought about that. Neither had I until I read an article in the Oregonian a number of years ago. Did you know that background music affects how many bites per minute you will take and the total length of time you will stay in the restaurant? Is it Mark? I didn't know that. Well, just the facts, please. Dining with slow music, 14 minutes longer in the restaurant than individuals dining where fast music was playing. Hmm. So if they are playing fast music, maybe the message is please eat and leave so we will have more room to serve others and make more money. Hmm. Be careful. If the music is too fast, you'll eat fast and eat more and more. In other words, you eat to the beat. So next time you go out to eat, gauge yourself, measure it. All right. So we are not focusing on eating habits and background music tonight. But it is about how worship habits in the Christian church and how the background of the Antichrist is affecting most Christians today unawares. Matter of fact, did you know that the sinister Antichrist has been playing an alluring tune down through the centuries that has caused many to be confused about the Big Ten, about the Ten Commandments of God. I am talking about the changes that the Antichrist has made to the Ten Commandments and how this is affecting the worship and beliefs of millions of wonderful Christians today. Number one, we're going to do this in question and answer format. Number one, has the Antichrist done something to the law of God that is affecting millions of good Christians without them knowing about it? Take your Bible and turn with me to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Daniel 7 verse 25. All right. Here in the Old Testament, after the book of Ezekiel, before the book of Hosea, we have Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. I appreciate the AV team there trying to work with these uh, video clips. All right. So Daniel 7 and verse number 25. All right. We get that together. Speaking about the dark deeds of the Antichrist. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Shall persecute the saints the Most High. And shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. So the Bible is very clear that the sinister Antichrist would perpetrate some lies about the Ten Commandments. Specifically the one relating to times and law. Well, what do you call the laws of the Most High? The Ten Commandments. Which one refers to times and law? There's only one. It stands out. It's a singular commandment about remember the Sabbath day. That's time. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Take your Bible and turn with me to the dynamic book of Exodus. We're going to Exodus to read the fourth commandment. Remember. The Bible predicted that the sinister Antichrist would change the law of God, specifically the one that relates to time, the seventh day Sabbath, the fourth commandment, tucked away there in the book of Exodus chapter 20. You want 2020 vision? Look at Exodus 20. We need to have the eyesight of the Ten Commandments. We need that. So look here, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jew. Is that what it says? The Bible says in Deuteronomy 4, 2, don't add to it and don't take away from it. Amen? And it also says that in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, it says don't add to it, to it or take away from it. And so the Bible makes it very clear the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's not a denominational theory. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Now, would you agree? If we can't get the Ten Commandments straight, what in the world can we get straight? How many agree? These are just 
basics. This is fundamental. This is foundational. We need to understand. I mean, come on now. You grew up, perhaps, many of us grew up with the Ten Commandments hanging somewhere. The Ten Commandments. They're not complex. They're not difficult. They're simple and basic, but the sinister Antichrist has made some significant changes to the Ten Commandments, especially the one that relates to time, the seventh day Sabbath. So the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Hence, it's the Lord's Day, the seventh day. That's Saturday. Matter of fact, look up Saturday. Webster says it's the seventh day of the week. So the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. We discovered last night that the number seven is very, very, very significant in things of God, in the word of God, and in end time prophecy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Why? Why keep the Sabbath? For in six days the Lord made, created, the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That is, he made it holy. Now, the next commandment, I bet you the next commandment is probably one of the most popular commandments in your household. Look at the next commandment. Oh, we don't want to forget this one. A lot of us have kids here. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother when you feel like it. You want your children to be right here now, don't you? Okay, kids, listen up. This is a good commandment. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, what if your children said, but I'm not a Jew. I can disobey you. <laughs> oh, you... Why do you bring that commandment up to your children in a very gentle and loving way? And rightly so. Why is this commandment one that you might bring up if you do it in the right spirit? But yeah, you need to remind that this is what God says. Why do you bring it up? Because it's relevant, because it's timely, because it's spot on, because it's, it's the guidance and the counsel you want your children to be raised with. So why, why should we emphasize the fourth commandment? Because that's the one that God says, remember, don't forget this one. Well, then we have a right then to remind everybody to keep this one because God knew that this would be the most forgotten commandment. And so we keep going. So has the Antichrist attacked the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant? Oh, yes. So where is the true Ark of the Covenant? In Revelation eleven nineteen, we read there in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, by matter of fact, let's go there, everybody. Let's go there very quickly. Revelation chapter 11. Last book for the last hours, for the last book for the last days. We're looking here at Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened where? In heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquakes, and great hail. So the Bible makes it very, very clear that the true ark of the covenant is where? It's in the heavenly sanctuary, in the heavenly temple. And so don't miss this. It's the Ark of the Covenant. What does the Ark of the Covenant contain? It's an Ark and it contains something. The Covenant. What is the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. But the New Covenant is that he writes it in our heart. Amen? Write it in our hearts. So the, the Antichrist has attacked the Ten Commandments by saying that God gave them authority to revise it and to change it. And so would you agree when God wrote it and spoke it, the Ten Commandments were perfect. They don't need, did, did God give the Ten Commandments and then he put a footnote subject to change? No, God didn't do that. They're unchangeable, unbreakable, unshakable, foundational. And so Question three, where is Jesus now? He's in the temple of God that is open in heaven. He's there at the right hand of God. He's there by the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. Therefore, Jesus stands at his mercy seat to intercede for us. That means when we pray, those prayers are taken up by God, taken up by Jesus. And Jesus presents them before the Father, flawless, perfect. He knows what you're trying to say when you pray. 
How many agree? Sometimes we, we, you know, we have a hard time expressing exactly how we feel. But the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in our prayer life. According to Romans 8, 26, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. And Jesus is our intercessory to take our prayers. Shouldn't that encourage us in our prayer life? This is something that Mark Fox is very passionate about in my preaching and teaching. Is that we all might be men and women, boys and girls of prayer. Do you know why we don't pray more than we do? Lack of faith. Because if you believed you really had God on the line, you know, God was calling you, would you be in a hurry to get off the phone? Especially what if God, you actually could hear his voice on your cell phone and God actually said to you, let me know what you need. If you ask in my son's name, Jesus, I'm ready to give it to you. You wouldn't be in a hurry to get off the phone and man, you could think of all sorts of different things. God wants us to be people of prayer, and the fact that Jesus Christ is interceding for us right now should inspire our prayer life and increase our faith. So Jesus stands, check it out, Jesus stands by his Ten Commandments in the heavenly sanctuary. Therefore, if Jesus stands there, so if Jesus is standing by his covenant, by his Ten Commandments, have they been changed? No, it hasn't been changed. See, but people want to argue. Oh, we don't need to keep the seventh-day Sabbath. No, 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 that's a Jewish thing. And no, 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 you're, you're just following a denominational theory about the seventh-day Sabbath. You don't, we don't, oh, didn't Paul say this? And didn't Jesus say that? And didn't the Bible say this? And they try to take Scripture, twist it, and try to explain away the commandment that says remember. No, 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 you don't need to remember try to talk you out of it. Well, didn't Paul say this? Didn't Jesus say this? Didn't the, and they get confused. And I said, well, wait a minute. Look up. And what do you see by faith? More than a ceiling. Doesn't take any faith to say, I think I see a ceiling. That's not faith. Faith is when you go beyond the ceiling, go beyond the clouds and you go up, up, up. There's Jesus. I'm going to agree. If you could really gaze up and just look up, perfectly and actually see what's going on. It's actually going on. It's real. Jesus is real. He really is interceding for us, but we've got to believe it by faith, by faith. And so by faith, he's interceding for us. Jesus is interceding for us and he's right there by his 10 commandments. Therefore, this should solve every single argument against the seventh day Sabbath. Because I've heard them all. I've heard a lot of interesting arguments. I'm sure Pastor Angel has as well. But let let me tell you something. God knows how to simplify things. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, you got that scripture? Okay, yeah, I got 50 scriptures. Okay, I got 52. And so how about this one? Match this. There's Jesus. He's standing by his Ten Commandments. Well, I guess that settles it. You say, Mark, I just, I just wish I could explain things more clearly and so forth. Take this scripture. Take this scripture. Revelation eleven nineteen is one of the number one reasons why I am traveling and sharing the three angels' messages because of what Jesus Christ is doing right now. Now, he's interceding for us in the most holy place, in the heavenly temple, by the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ten Commandments are still there. Remember, the Ark on earth was a type of the one that is in heaven. Amen? There was an earthly temple, there's a heavenly temple. There's the Ark of the Covenant there, there's the Ark of Covenant in heaven. There's the mercy seat, the throne of God. And the Bible makes it very clear, if there is Ten Commandments and an Ark down here, I've got news for you. There's the Ten Commandments right there. The original version right there in heaven, that Ten Commandment law. And I repeat, this simplifies things. This makes it easy. You might not be able to remember 100 verses and so forth. If you can, I mean, put forth effort, absolutely. And we're dealing with more scriptures than this one. But just remember this. Oh, Mark, he shared a scripture there somewhere in the Bible. And it was something about looking up and seeing Jesus. By his Ten Commandments. Is that simple, yes or no? Is that, is that not powerful? Powerful? 
you know, look, I have met thousands and thousands and thousands of people in my life, either in person or on our YouTube channel, 24 million views and so forth. And I zoom in on the scripture and I say, this is it. This is the one. This is the one that simplifies it, reinforces it, explains it. Jesus Christ is interceding at the mercy seat. And underneath the mercy seat is the Ten Commandment law. Aren't you glad the law is not on top and mercy down below and so forth? We're under, not under the law in terms of its condemnation, but we're under grace. But being under grace is not disgrace because under grace or under mercy seat is his Ten Commandments that he writes in our heart. How many are thankful there is the new covenant and that is what God is able to do in our hearts. You and I cannot truly obey. Paul was a Pharisee and he said he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He believed he could obey. And man, outwardly, he was impeccable. The man had really a good reputation and so forth. And like, wow, look at Paul. He really is holy. But then when Paul began to see the spiritual nature of the law of God, he felt undone. He felt unsure. He felt like he was a sinner. Aren't you glad that it's only the Holy Spirit that can write it in our heart? Outward is not enough. It needs to be written in the heart. Amen. So, Question number four, what is the standard in the judgment? So speak and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. It's interesting. It's called, Ten Commandments are called the law of liberty. You say, how, in that, how is that liberty? When you know that Jesus Christ is giving you strength to obey his law. That's a law of liberty. Amen. There is no liberty in breaking God's commandments. You can't call that freedom. Nor can you call freedom trying to keep the commandments in your own strength. That's not freedom. There's only one way, and that is to view the law as a law of liberty if you follow it through the power of Jesus Christ. And so we are judged by the law of God. We are not saved by the law of God, but we are judged by the law of God. In other words, anybody can say, I love Jesus, but the law is a standard of right and wrong, righteousness and unrighteousness. It's a standard of, of what is sin and what's not and so forth. And so we can say, well, I, I believe this and I love Jesus and so forth, but we're judged by the law, but not saved by the law. So if a person says, I love Jesus, the fr if there's the root, there'll be the fruit. Say that with me. If there's the root, there'll be the fruit. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And by, what does the Bible say? By their fruits you shall know them. Matthew 7 and verse 20. Let's keep going. So if the standard in the judgment, and we're living in the hour of his judgment. Remember we had a whole message devoted to how we're living in the hour of God's judgment. So if the standard of the judgment is the law of God, has it been changed? The answer is, is No. So what is the new covenant? Hebrews 8.10, he writes it on our heart. He writes it on our heart. Number six, which commandment is a reminder of God's creative power and recreative power, a sign of the covenant? We already read it, Exodus 28 to 11, about remembering the Sabbath day. And it's a special sign, Ezekiel 20, 12. Let's read it together. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. What does that mean? Jesus makes us holy. Jesus changes our heart. And that's a day-by-day -day growth experience. By the way, if you ever want to watch a good movies, watch something about Pilgrim's Progress. I highly recommend the book. I recommend different movies on it. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress. There's a little Saturday night homework for you. So at any rate, all I know is the Bible tells us, God speaking, that the Sabbath is a peculiar, special, distinctive sign. It's a sign of the work of Christ in the human heart. It's a sign that Jesus is able to save us. No wonder the devil hates the Sabbath because of all that it stands for. It's a reminder. This is, Sabbath is not a reminder of bad news. Like, oh man, here comes the Sabbath again. No, it's like, here comes that reminder of what Jesus is doing in my life. It's a promise. Do you know that all his commands are promises? Because God would never tell us. How many agree? There's a lot of do's and don'ts in this book. 
There's a whole lot of rules and guidance and so forth here. And we need every bit of it. But I'm here to tell you that it's only Jesus Christ that can give us the power and all those commands. When God says, remember the Sabbath day, that's a promise that he'll help me to do it. So the Sabbath is a sign, a very special sign that he is converting me, that he's changing my heart heart, that he is doing a wonderful thing in my life. So the Sabbath is a sign or reminder of the power, unparalleled, unlimited power of Christ to save us from sin. Sin is very powerful. Come on now. Sin is very powerful. You and I are powerless to overcome sin. You can say, oh, no, I'm going to overcome this sin. Well, you do have to have resolve. You do have to have a decisiveness. But even that's not enough. Only the Lord can go deep. I'm going to agree. You've got to go deep in the recesses and the springs of your heart. And Jesus is able to do it. And he promises to do it. And we must have faith that he is doing it. Amen? That he's changing our heart. So the Sabbath is a sign of our marriage covenant with God. So number seven, who is the Antichrist? Is there an intriguing, suspicious, and surprising connection between the Antichrist and the Ten Commandments of God? Is there a connection there? Absolutely, there is a striking connection. Now let us do a background check on the Antichrist. All right, let's do a background check. The Antichrist was clearly and correctly identified by all the Protestant reformers down through the centuries. So here we have in Daniel chapter 7, here we have four strange beasts arising from the tumultuous waters. We have here a winged lion, Babylon, bear, Medo-Persia, leopard with four heads and a couple sets of wings, Greece. Then came the iron monarchy of Rome, represented by this uh, ferocious ten-horned uh, creature. So in this panorama prophetic vision, we see some intriguing symbols. We need to carefully, prayerfully decode the symbolic language. Here we have the dramatic rise and fall of four successive world empires. I repeat, Babylon, Medo-Persia. Greece and Rome, and then Rome was divided originally into ten horns, ten kingdoms, all right? So these ten original tribes or kingdoms find their modern counterparts in the modern nations of Europe today with the exception of three, and those were the Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths. And so, but the Alamanni are with us today in, 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 among Germans, Franks, French, Saxons, English, Visigoths, Spanish, Burgundian, Swiss, Lombards, Italian, and uh, Suave, Portuguese. And so, let's just get a snapshot review of some of the prophetic clues about the Antichrist that we find tucked away in Daniel chapter 7. All of these clues are taken from Daniel chapter 7. Now, we devoted an entire night to focusing on exposing the Antichrist. And so this is a little bit of a snapshot review because we're going to zoom in more about how the Antichrist has attacked God's law and God's Sabbath. So number one, it arose out of the fourth beast. That is, it arose out of pagan Rome. Number two, it arose among the ten horns. That is, among the ten divisions of Rome. In other words, the Antichrist would arise from Europe. It would be a Roman power rising from Europe in addition to that, timing, clue number three, after the ten horns, that is sometime after the breakup of the Roman Empire, sometime after 476 AD, according to historians, uh, it would arise to prominence in the fifth century. Clue number four, it would be different from the other horns. The others were political in scope and nature. This one would be religious and political. Number five, a look more stout than his fellows. It would dominate Europe. Notice I give you scripture references. Notice all these references are in Daniel 7. It's all right there. Friends, now is the time that Sandpoint needs these messages. This is the time. God sent me here at this time. But I'm going to say it again. Go get your friends. Go get your enemies. Go get whoever. Bring them here. 
I praise God that you're here. Come whether you bring anybody or not. But I have a burden that while I'm here, while I'm here, I'm not all that, but I know I'm on an assignment here. And God has led us together. And there are people that you need to invite. And there are people that you have invited. And the devil doesn't want you to invite people. And the devil doesn't want the people you invited to come out. How many realize this is war? Are you listening to me? This is war. Everybody say, this is war. It's real war. This is no secular pursuit here, everybody. This is, this is a kingdom of God agenda. Amen. So I urge you, go get your friends. How can I not just break away and say this? Because this, these messages are so monumental. And you know what? When you watch the election and when you watch what's going on in the world, the COVID and the fires and the social unrest and who knows what is going to happen, this should drive us to the Word of God. And not only that, it should drive us to our friends and our loved ones saying, you have to come to these series of meetings. At least come out once and see and taste and see that the Lord is good. How many are willing to take me up on this encouragement? I just feel inspired by the Holy Spirit in my heart to urge you, my brother, my sister. Plead with people to come if you have to. Maybe you're the type, you're an introvert. The Holy Spirit can put words in your mouth. I didn't say you had to give a Bible study on it necessarily. No, you can bring them to the Bible study if you want. Oh, Lord, I pray all those watching on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and those here present, help us to be determined to get others to learn these truths in Jesus' name. We can all say amen. So number six, it would uproot three kingdoms, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Number seven, spoke great words against the Most High. The book of Revelation coins that blasphemy. Is there a religious power, a Roman religious power that was able to dominate the Dark Ages, persecuted those who went against it, and all the Protestant reformers believed it was none other than the Roman papal power? This is not guesswork. This isn't Mark Fox's opinion. This is Bible and history. So spoke great words against the Most High. What does blasphemy mean? Claiming to forgive sin? The Roman papal power claims that and says, go and confess your sins to a priest. Claims Mother Mary as a mediatrix and hears prayers of the saints. Matter of fact, spoke great words against the Most High, Matthew, uh, pardon me, Daniel 7.25. Penance, purgatory, Mary as an intercessor, confession to priests, enforced celibacy. You know, they say that Peter was the first pope. How can that be? Because if you're pope, you can't get married. And Peter was married. How do we know that? Because Jesus healed his mother-in-law's fever. Healed her. And uh, image worship changed the Ten Commandments. Infallibility of the Pope. Sprinkling instead of immersion. Baptism and on and on and the little list goes. That's just a short list. Number eight, wore out the saints of the Most High. That is a persecuting power. And we see a wretched past of the Dark Ages in which the Roman papal power killed 50 million people. They were behind it. They orchestrated it. So the inescapable conclusion, the undeniable evidence, all point to papal Rome. It's irrefutable. And so the book of Daniel depicts a strange little talking horn that would actually talk and say things that are false and would persecute those who disagreed. This is none other than the Antichrist of biblical prophecy. Number nine, what has the Roman papal system done to the Ten Commandments? I repeat, thought to change times and laws, to modify the Ten Commandments, think to change times and laws. Now, friends, right there, I'll give you a little bit of insight about soul winning. This is one of the most powerful things you can share with people. I believe there's going to be many Roman Catholics in heaven but they won't continue to be Roman Catholic in heaven. 
I believe that there are many Protestants who will be in heaven and many won't. I'm not the judge, but I will tell you this, that the evidence is so clinching and so overwhelming. It's just mind-blowing to see the clear clues to track down prophecies most wanted, the sinister Antichrist. And when people see it, I'm telling you, it's electrifying when people see this. Isn't it true, Pastor Angel, that, that when people see it, they're alarmed, alerted, and awakened. And um, prophecy does all that. This is why I have a burden. By the way, Pastor, I was thinking sometime I want to get all of the teenagers together and I want to speak to them before I leave here. Do I have the parents' permission? I want to talk to those teenagers and encourage them. Our teenagers need encouragement. I have two of them. And uh, so I want you to know that I'm here not only for these nightly meetings, I'm here. I want to speak to the teenagers while I'm here. And one of the things I want to tell the teenagers is, you want to do something that's really cool? Study Bible prophecy. It's amazing of the evidence. And when our young people are able to see that they can understand it, they're empowered to witness. Amen? God chooses first kids. Remember, the disciples were like, hey, moms, you know, could you get the kids away, please? And Jesus said, no, 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 let the little kids come to me. That's my kingdom. <laughs> and he said, unless we become like little children, we're not going to go to heaven. It kind of makes me want to observe kids and see if I can learn a few things. Think to change times and laws. So what is the only commandment that has anything to do with time? The fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath. I repeat myself because when it's repeated, it's more crystallized and, 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 and it's more cemented in your mind and your thinking. And then instead of, you know, when you get home, hey, what did you learn? Oh, I don't know. It was good, but I can't remember anything. <laughs> At least you'll remember some things that I repeated several times. And that is the Roman papal power has attacked the Ten Commandments, specifically the one on the Sabbath. God said, remember and the Roman papal power says, don't worry about the seventh day. Go with the first day. Friends, the Roman Catholic Church has given us counterfeit commandments. You know what they have done? They didn't stop there. They changed the uh, uh, other commandments, and I'll get into that in a moment. So who is the Antichrist acting as if they are when they change the law of God? It's acting like you're God. And what did Paul say? Read it together with me. And the man of sin is revealed so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Is he God? Yes or no? Of course not. But is he acting like he's God and like he's saying God gave them the authority to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? Friends, that's the man of sin. So who changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? None other than the Roman Catholic church. So are you ready for history's best kept secrets? How many remember Paul Harvey would give you the rest of the story? That's going to date some of us, but go to old Paul Harvey. Can I also mention this, that Paul Harvey attended a Seventh-day Adventist church right up until he died there in the Phoenix, Arizona area. He was no pushover, but he knew some of these things that you're learning. And so three changes that the Roman Catholic Church has done to the Ten Commandments in their catechism. In their catechism, the second commandment that prohibits making images and bowing down to them has been conveniently, compromisingly deleted. The second commandment made the Tenth Commandment into two. <clears throat> made it into two. Made the Tenth Commandment two. And then changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Matter of fact, in their catechism... They made the fourth commandment into the third commandment. And you know what they did there? They abbreviated it. They reduced it from 94 words to eight words. My friends, there is a reason why it's a lengthy commandment. Every word counts. Amen. So here are four shocking facts. Number one, Daniel predicted the change. Number two, the church admits the change. Number three, 
history reveals the change. Number four, the Bible condemns the change. Number five, what are you going to do about it? I say, let's change to keep the right day that he did not change. If anyone changes, it must not be God. It must be us that we're willing to make a change. Because I know many of you, many of you tell me that uh, this is new. And so if it's new to you, I encourage you, go to your knees, pray about it, and follow the light that God gives to you. Number 10, does the papacy make it clear that they change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? What do you think? Oh, yes. Here's a convert's catechism. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. This is the Catholic Church. Question, why do we, the Catholic Church, observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday. Because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea in the 4th century, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now that is a very frank, candid admission. Are you ready for another admission from the Roman papal power? Here's another one. This is James, the late James Cardinal Gibbons. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. Another Catholic quote. There it is. Number 11. Are majority wrong about the Seventh-day Sabbath? Yes. A matter of fact, in Revelation 12, go with me to Revelation 12, 17. Are you telling me, Mark, that majority are wrong about the Sabbath? That's exactly what I'm saying. And so I'm here to tell you there's a lot of fake news in Christian churches today. Now that expression, you and I didn't grow up with that expression, fake news. But have you discovered that news today does have a bias one way or the other? And I want to tell you something, what we should be more concerned about where the news is at on things and whether they're re it's real or fake news or twisted news and so forth. What we should concern ourselves with is what news are we believing about the word of God? There's some false teachings, fake news going on in the churches today. And so we're looking at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. But Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen. John 8, 32. So here we have it. The dragon. Who's the dragon? That's the devil. Was enraged with the woman. Who's the woman? The church. And he went to make war with the rest of offspring. In the King James, it's rendered remnant. Everybody shout out remnant. All right. He went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. How many want to be in that group right there? You want to be among the remnant. Everybody shout out remnant. You want to be in the remnant. And so I'm here to tell you, majority are wrong, but the remnant are right. The remnant are right. So they keep the commandments of God, including the seventh day Sabbath, and only a remnant are getting it straight. So if you're looking to see what majority believe, you're going to be off base. You're going to be off kilter. You're going to be misled. You're going to go astray. The Bible truths and Bible prophecies, the amazing prophecies in the scriptures, majority don't understand it. Majority of books, I would say about 95% of the books in Christian bookstores or 95% of the televangelists today are telling you that the Antichrist is in the future. And if all of a sudden Martin Luther... John Calvin, Wesley Brothers, Knox, Tyndale, John Huss, etc. All these reformers were all of a sudden to be resurrected and they came here to speak tonight. They would tell you, what in the world is being taught? 
the Antichrist is the Roman papal power. But we've drifted and drifted and drifted. There's been a horrible apostasy, a departure from the faith that was once delivered to the saints, Jude verse 3. But the Bible says we must earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And that's what these series of meetings are all about. It's about let's go back to basics. Let's go back to the word of God. Two C words. Let's go to the cross and let's go to the commandments of God in that order. Go to the cross. So our majority wrong about the seventh-day Sabbath? You remember in the time of Jesus, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? This was an argument that was being used against believing in Jesus. Oh, come on, you're not going to believe in Jesus. Why? Come on, the religious leaders don't believe in him. And so 2,000 years later, truth is never popular. Nine out of ten. Most agree with nine of the Ten Commandments. Here again, this is a simple, a simple thing. Children can understand this. That God gave us ten, and if you say, well, I'm willing to follow nine out of ten, then you're breaking all of them. Because the Bible says if you break one, you break them all, according to James chapter 2 and verse 10. And so, can majority be wrong? Can experts be wrong? Mark Twain said, Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. Oh, yeah. Sometimes the majority are wrong. They told Christopher Columbus, you're crazy, man. Because everybody knew they would fall off at the end of the world there, the edge of the world. And, uh, but no, he discovered uh, the world is round. And I know there's flat earthers out there. I mean, did I ever think I would ever hear this kind of argument? If you, are, if you believe in the flat earth, I don't want to hear about it. You keep it to yourself. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There is a horizon. The world is round. And it's similar to other planets that are, you know, have you ever seen a planet that's square? <laughs> so I'm here to tell you, though. There's a lot of false teachings. Lieutenant Joseph Ives, after visiting the Grand Canyon in 1861, said, Ours has been the first and doubtless to be the last to visit this profitless locality. Guess what's one of the most popular tourist sites? The Grand Canyon. How you figure. And then Western Union Memo, 1876. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. How many have a cell phone on you? <laughs> How many remember pay booths, pay for these phone booths? Man, if you can get one, you made a lot of money. Put it in your garage. Keep it for a relic, and it'll be worth something in a few years. The experts said that Titanic could never sink. Uh, but it did on April 14, 1912. And then Irving Fisher, professor of economics of Yale University, in 1929, he said, stocks have reached a permanently high plateau. Do you see the picture? You know what that's all about? <laughs> it's a rush to get their money. And so what about this one? What about this one? A professor of strategy and uh, says here, airplanes are interesting toys, but they are of no military value whatsoever. Does anybody study about World War I and World War II and Vietnam War, Korean War, and so forth? Uh, planes factor big time. Albert Einstein in 1932 said, there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered. It will. Yeah, unfortunately... We have plenty of atomic bombs just ready to go off. DECA executive, 1962, after turning down the Beatles, we don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on their way out. Guess what is the most popular group of all time? The Beatles. And then how about this one? Ken Olson, president of Digital Equipment Corps, 1977. There is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. How many have a laptop? How about this one? I'm just showing. Come on now. I'm just showing. 
that the experts can get it wrong. Majority can be wrong. How about this one? A Boeing engineer after the first flight of 247, a twin engine plane that carried ten, a whopping 10 people. There will never be a bigger plane built. Airbus A380, passenger capacity up to 853. That's a good chunk of sand point. Just boom, up in the air. <laughs> so the majority are wrong about the Ten Commandments. The majority are wrong about the Ten Commandments and they're wrong about worship on the correct day. Now, I can worship God every day, but there's one day that is to be the primary day of worship where we come together to worship God on his holy day in his holy place. Now, as a general rule, we want to come together on Sabbath in a church, uh, some building where we can gather together. But I'm here to tell you, sometimes you may choose not to come to church. You want to go out in the mountains. In other words, just go in your backyard here, okay? But uh, anyway, the point is, is that the idea is seek God in a special way on a Sabbath. And where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them, according to Matthew 18 and verse 20. Survey, more Americans know Big Mac ingredients than Ten Commandments. Little poll taken in 2007. And so, number 12, how does the book of Revelation symbolize the urgent preaching of the Seventh-day Sabbath in the last days? Go with me to Revelation chapter 14. Are we learning some th something tonight? So we're looking at Revelation 14, verse 6. Revelation 14, 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, worldwide, worldwide, global. And it's the everlasting gospel. And it must be preached swiftly. The angels are flying. The message is going to go swiftly. Swiftly. And when I think about our YouTube channel, I have to mention this repeatedly. You know why? Because as an evangelist, I want to reach as many people as possible, as fast as possible, and talk about angels flying while I'm speaking to you right now. Meanwhile, people are watching what you're hearing here. They're watching on my channel. And I get, and I, and I get, sometime I'll show you on the screen, I get, I get responses from all over the planet. And they're saying, I believe the Sabbath. Can you, and many of them, many of them are asking, what church do you recommend that keeps the Sabbath? I think we have a few ideas, don't you think? People will tell me, um, I want to be baptized. What, what can, you, can you help me? And of course, myself and our staff and so forth, we have paid staff, we have some volunteers. We can't keep up with it all. Pray for us. Pray because we're growing exponentially. So when I read this, when I read this, you know, we've done probably about 150 different seminars in person like this over the years, a series of meetings like this since 1979. But we are reaching more people than I ever dreamed possible, ever dreamed possible. The testimonies, the changed lives and so forth. And um, I'm here to tell you, it is thrilling to be part of God's remnant church in the last days and see what God is doing. We have authoritative, crisp, clear answers to what's going on in the world. We're not just scratching ourselves saying, I don't know what in the world's going on. No, we do want know what's going on. We know exactly. It's all part of the prophecies. Amen. We can give answers. We can give solid proof of what's going on. And so I urge you, I urge you, become a soul winner. Get people watching our channel. Bring people to the meetings and so forth. Hand out literature and so forth. Let's work for God. Amen. I get passionate about this. You know what? Let me tell you something. I'll let you know on a little secret. When I realize that God is willing to speak through little old me, I mean, I'm nothing. But I realize that God uses me. And it inspires my faith. Well, 
God will do the same thing with your mouth. If you just say, Lord, I'm not Mark Fox. And, uh, you know, I'm not Mark Fox. I'm me. And I got a mouth. Use it, Lord. And you know what? I dare you to say that. I dare you to say that prayer. Lord, um, use me. And watch out. <laughs> He's going to do it. <laughs> He's going to do it. And you know what it'll do? It'll increase your faith. Now, don't get me wrong. I know you are already, many of you, maybe all of you are witnessing to some extent. But if you want to stay on fire for Jesus Christ, witness. Back to the first angel's message. Here we go. Verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. We had a whole message on that. And worship him who made, created heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. Friends, that's a direct allusion or a direct quote back to the fourth commandment, the most forgotten commandment. So in the first angel's message, the Bible makes it very clear that these messages are to be preached around the world. Swiftly, loud voice, calling people, worship the creator and keep the commandments of God. Is there a commandment that relates to worshiping the creator? Yes. Look at verse 12. Here is the patience, the endurance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So this is going to be a seventh day keeping church. A seventh day keeping people of God. I can go to church seven days a week, but there's, I want to be part of a church that's uplifting all ten of these commandments. And preaching the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so who is our creator? God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3, verse 9. This is part of the gospel message. So which of the Ten Commandments is referred to in verse 7? Here it is, worship him who made heaven and earth and the spring, sea and the springs of water. It's the fourth commandment. So our creator is calling us to worship him more fully in these last days. So friends, listen to me. Don't you want to be part of these three angels? This is dynamic. We can be part of this. Do you know that you and I can hasten the return of Jesus Christ? How many would like Jesus to come a little bit sooner? God wants to. Don't you think Jesus wants to come? But he's wanting us to work first. And if all of his people were faithful and witnessing and working for God, Jesus would come very quickly. Why hasn't he come yet? His church is sleeping. Not everybody. And spiritual sleep goes with lack of fervent praying. Your measure of faith and conversion and so forth is reflected in your prayer life. And so in the last days, there's a call to coming back to keeping all of God's commandments, Revelation 14, 12, coming back to worshiping the creator as he specified in his 10 commandments. Friends, can I tell you the truth? If you're wanting to find a church, you should find a church that's preaching these three angels' messages around the world. Around the world. I want to be something, be part of something a lot bigger than myself, of course, and a lot bigger than, would you agree? What's going on right now with the remnant in God's sight, is big. Amen? So, what miracle does the seventh-day Sabbath commemorate? Two things. Creation and recreation. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalms 51, verse 10. I'm going to agree, that's a miracle. And the Sabbath is a reminder that God is working miracles in your life. I challenge you, I, I call this my miracle book. You can get one of these at Walmart or Staples or whatever, like five bucks. It's lined paper. Write down different things. Write down different miracles. Recognize that God's working miracles in your life. Write them down, just like Heidi shared with us. So write them down. Write down miracles. Because our God is working miracles every single day of our life. Every single day. But you know what the devil does? Try to blind you. So you're not seeing the miracles. Because the devil knows if you can see miracles that God is working in your life, you're going to have more faith. Your faith is going to be more robust and more stalwart and stronger. Friends, we are saved by 
grace through faith. You can't be saved without faith. And faith must be in what he has done, is doing, and will do in your life. Come on now. Write down your miracles. Get a prayer journal. Write things down. Because God is up to something in your life. Number 16. What three things did God do to the seventh-day Sabbath? He blessed it. He rested on it. And he made it holy. God told Adam and Eve to rest together with their creator on the seventh day. The first seven is in creation. So what is the purpose of the weekly cycle? Our life revolves around the weekly cycle, and it reminds us of the seventh-day Sabbath. God never called any other day the Sabbath except the seventh-day Sabbath. And so during the week, this is important. It's been said that if you want to be happy, you need three things. You need somebody to love. You need something to do. And you need something to look forward to. I'm going to agree. It's, we're, all, we're covered with that. I'm going to agree. We can love God with all our heart and he loves us. We can love our neighbor as ourself. Something to do. <laughs> Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Matthew 4 verse 19. But what about this? Have something to look forward to. The word of God says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for those who love him. First Corinthians 2 verse 9. So listen. During the week, there should be anticipation. Because as you're reading the creation story, it's just full of anticipation. All right, here's what he did on the first day. Here's what he did the second day. And it's building. How many understand that creation could have been in split second, everything's created? Could God have done it like that? He could have just, he didn't have to form us the way he did. He could just speak and boom. Okay, he just spoke. He spoke. Different things happened, but he did it one day at a time. And then when it came to creating us, he got down in the dirt. And he fashioned us. That cheekbone and so forth. Yeah, that was God. That was God. Your eye socket there, that was God. How many agree? God formed us of the dust of the ground, breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Would you like to see what a living soul looks like? How you doing? So I want you to notice here, during the week, there should be anticipation. Anticipation. Look, I'm a daddy, and if you want your kids happy, they need to have something to look forward to. Is that true, yes or no? Hey, if you're good, here, we're going to go and get you some healthy dessert. All right, anyway. Anticipation. All during the week. Is it Sabbath yet, mommy and daddy? Oh, it's coming. Is it Sabbath? And then on the Sabbath, reflection on what he's done during the week. Amen? Every one of us should have a testimony. Number 18, who does the Sabbath belong to? Listen to what Jesus says. Read it together with me. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 28. If Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, then whose day is it? It's the Lord's day. The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath day. Matthew 12 and verse number 8. This is Jesus speaking. How many believe Jesus? Amen. So, number 19. Is the Lord's day still holy? Oh, yes. Read it together with me. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So the spirit being in the spirit on the Lord's day. Number 20. Did Jesus ever change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? No. Would he ever change his law? Go with me to Matthew 5. <clears throat> Are we learning something? Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think. Well, if Jesus is telling, telling us something he doesn't want us to think, well, then you know the enemy is wanting you to think it. Here it is. Do not think that it came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, look at Matthew 3, Matthew 3, and look at number 15, verse number 15. I just turned a page in my Bible. 
But Jesus answered and said to him, speaking to John the Baptist when he wanted to be baptized, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Now, now let's, just, let's just think about this. Jesus said to John the Baptist, who protested about baptizing Jesus because Jesus was perfect and John the Baptist knew that. And so, but Jesus said, no, baptize me because it fulfills righteousness. Notice the word fulfill. Well, Jesus fulfilled baptism. But then did he tell us to go and baptize people, which we're going to do in a couple weeks from now? Huh? Yes. So the word fulfill here doesn't mean that was chapter 3 and same thing in chapter 5. Fulfill doesn't mean done away with. Rather, he fulfilled it by setting an example for us to follow. And so back here, let's go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away or One jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so the Bible is very clear. Jesus wants us to keep all of the commandments and to teach people so. Go with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. You see, all things work together for good. Romans 3, verse 31. I've got my Bible. How about you? Romans 3, verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Is it clear that Paul said that if you have faith, it will lead you to obedience to the law of God? Now look at Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. What does the New Testament teach about obedience to the law of God? Romans 6, we're looking there at uh, verse number 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law that is under condemnation, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, that is break God's law, because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. So now let's look at 1 John chapter 2, 3 and 4. 1 John chapter 2, 3 and 4. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments, including the Sabbath, is a liar and the truth is not in him. So is it clear that if we say we love the Lord, we want to obey his ten commandments. Amen. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Look now there at Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the what? Into the city. Friends, this is not our home. We're, we're pilgrims. We're just passing through. We're just passing through. This life is so short, fragile, and temporary. Is that true? And so the Bible makes it very clear Who's going to heaven? We just read it. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. What is it going to be like to eat from the tree of life? When you and I go to heaven, our appetite will never be so strong and the food will never be so good. What will it be like when we go to heaven? The Bible makes it very clear. We're going to keep the Sabbath, even of the earth made new. Go with me. We read this last night. I want to read this one again. Let's go to Isaiah 66. We're going to keep heaven in the, we're going to keep the Sabbath, even in the earth made new when heaven is on earth. You know, eventually heaven is going to be on earth. But when Jesus comes, we're going to be with the Lord where he is. But eventually he's going to recreate this world. He's going to recreate this planet. Everything perfection. And we're going to do what? Verse 22 and 23. Isaiah 66, 22, 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I, will ma- shall, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants in your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, 
All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Is that good news, everybody? So we're going to keep that throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Can you imagine as we call a little get-together and say, hey, we want all the Sandpoint Crusade people. We got together there in 2020 and uh, the COVID was going on. Do you remember that? Hey, let's all meet around the tree of life uh, on such and such a date, you know, uh, one million years from now or whatever, you know. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to reminisce about these meetings? Friends, let's look at these meetings the way that God looks at them. Let's look up higher. God has a design. He has a plan. And so what did Jesus say about just breaking one of them? They should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Did Jesus, just have minutes left, did Jesus expect his disciples to keep the Sabbath after he was risen again? Yes. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. So Jesus expected them to keep the Sabbath. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So Jesus told his disciples, his followers, to pray about keeping the Sabbath after he ascended to heaven. And so should you also pray about keeping the Sabbath holy? They, they prayed about it. Should we pray about each time we will be faithful to enjoy the Sabbath? So which day is the Sabbath? Well, there's a web-based poll, World Net Daily, which day is the Sabbath? 24% in the poll said Sunday. 17% Saturday. Can't be sure. 8%. Any day one chooses, 6%. No Christian Sabbath, 6%. It's irrelevant, 1.4%. There's a lot of confusion about the Sabbath. Aren't you glad we're not confused? I'm not confused. Are you confused, yes or no? No, we don't need to be confused. We don't be confused. And can I let you know a little secret? Many times people are confused because they don't want to see the truth. Oh, I don't understand. It's too difficult to understand. No, you can understand if your heart is in the right place. You can understand. So can we really be sure which is the seventh day Sabbath? Absolutely. Webster's Dictionary, Saturday is the seventh day of the week. You say, well, that, that's a man-made uh, di dictionary. So, well, then just look at the Bible. Jesus rose on Sunday, the first day of the week, and he, the Sabbath was the day before that. Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Luke 4, 16. Read it with me. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue and stood up for to read. He, on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus knew which day was the seventh day Sabbath. The Jews continue to keep the same day that Jesus kept as the Sabbath. Number 25. Would God ever ask us to keep the Sabbath holy? knowing we would not be able to figure out which day it was? Would God really ask us to do that? No. And so which day did Jesus rest in the tomb after he died? That's right. It was on the seventh day of the week. The crucifixion weekend is right there in the gospel stories. Preparation day, he died on preparation day. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. And on the first day of the week, he was resurrected. So why did Jesus rest in the tomb on the Sabbath day? To show us the importance of resting on that day, even in his death. Even by his death, Jesus honored the seventh day Sabbath. Jesus died and finished his work. Jesus died and finished his work of redemption on the sixth day at the sixth hour. I want you to think about this. It was unheard of that any would, anyone would die from crucifixion within just six hours. It was unheard of. No, no, no. They would last for days on those cars. It was a cruel, horrible uh, way to die. But Jesus died after six hours, and he died of a broken heart. And so Jesus said, it is what? Finished. So there on the sixth day, at the, after six hours on the cross, on the seventh hour, and on the seventh day, he rested. Friends, is that a coincidence or is that God? Amen. That's God. So, friends, 
I make this appeal tonight. Follow Jesus Christ with all of your heart and with all of your strength and become a mighty champion in God's eyes. Witness for Christ. Carry around literature. Tell people they can go online how much easier can you get. Be a soul winner for Jesus Christ. We can't just see, li listen, it's so easy. Look at me, look at my eyes. It's so easy to say, well, that was a good message on the Sabbath. I already knew that. I'm feeling real good. But are you a soul winner? Starting first with your children. The most important field of missionary work is right there under your roof. Amen? You start with your children. But let your children see that it's more than just about them. It's about loving our neighbor as ourself. It's about being a witness. So I make an appeal. Those watching, I make an appeal. Become a soul winner in the hands of Christ. If you're willing, raise your hand. You want to be a soul winner for Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? My Father in heaven, as we close now, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. And to trust you with all our heart in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I believe the Pathfinders are going to take up an offering to pray the expenses here. While they're taking up an offering, you can just go ahead and along the aisles there. Tomorrow night, it's entitled Death's Mystery Solved. Death's Mystery Solved. Don't miss it. Supper at 5.30. And please pray for us. We're going to be seeking to um, do intros. Anyway, we're going to be doing some taping work in tomorrow afternoon, getting these programs ready for YouTube. So please pray for us as we uh, do that. Any other announcements, Pastor Angel? Any uh, other announcements? I think we got everything covered. And I uh, want to just say we love you in the name of Jesus. And we'll see you here tomorrow night. Can you at least be praying for me? Pray the Lord will bless my throat and everything else. God bless. Good night.